Hi, Dr. Sommer. Can you hear me fine? I can. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I apologize. I've been moving rooms because um, they've decided to redo the outside of my building today. So it's a little bit loud. No worries. You're fine. Yeah. Anyway. All right, cool. So we can, okay, it's 4 p.m. So we can get right on started. Um, we hey. have a good amount of people in here. All right. So I'll just start by um, introducing sure. us and then I will hand over the mic to you. Okay. But then awesome. you'll just pose questions. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. Hi, guys. I hope you're all taking care of yourself. My name is Iman and I run Global Youth for UNICEF. It's an international network of high school and college students who want to support UNICEF in advocating and fundraising for children's rights. Welcome to the third session of our series. Um, this one's a really popular one. So I hope that all of you guys can ask really good questions and feel free to write any comments below in your at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a chat feature and a Q&A feature. Um, you are free to use both. If you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A um, part of the chat. And if you have any questions, our moderators will be answering any general questions about the organization. So in case yours doesn't get answered, we're really, we apologize for that, but we're trying to answer as many questions as possible during the session due to limited time. Other than that, if you want to learn more about our work and what we do, please visit uh, unicefglobal.com and you can also sign up to join our team. Uh, that link will be posted by our moderators soon, so feel free to check that out and apply if you can. Other than that, that's pretty much it. Um, before we get started, I have a little bit of a poll to see where everyone's tuning in from, so I'll launch that really quickly and then we can go ahead and get started. All right, so that is launched. And while I'm talking, then we'll pass it on. And in about one minute, I'll share the results with you guys. Other than that, that's pretty much it. If you guys have any technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat box so we can get that handle ASAP. Um, but other than that, I'll now stop talking and hand it over to Dr. Sommer. And this is a really exciting uh, topic, menstrual health and inequities is a huge topic that's gaining traction recently. So we're really excited to hear her discuss her experience in the field and all her work. Sure. Well, I'm delighted to be here today. And actually, I, I can't wait to see. I did enter where I am, which is in New York City. So it'll be fun to see where people are all over the world joining today. Um, it's an honor to join you all and even to know about the series. I'm glad that you're gathering and you're continuing discussions around really critical issues, even while the world is sort of in such a challenging place. So um, should I just say a little bit about where I'm based and what I do or what would be yeah. best? So just go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit maybe about the work you've done. Um, as you mentioned in the GATE program at Columbia and in Tanzania, we'd love to learn more about that. Sure, sure. So um, I'm a professor at Columbia University in the School of Public Health, um, and I run what we call the GATE program, Gender, Adolescent Transitions and Environment, which is really just an umbrella for the range of different things we work on. Um, and I'll focus today, understandably, on sort of what we work on that uh, sort of relates to menstruation. Um, but just to sort of tie together a little sort of Tanzania and what I'm doing now and um, and also to mention the work I do through a small nonprofit I started in 2010, which is called Grow and Know and focuses on developing puberty books for girls and boys. Um, so I'll just maybe tell you a little story of how that all came to be, um, just to sort of hopefully it will start to make a little sense. But um, back when I finished college, I don't know the age groups of everybody who's on here today, but um, in college, I didn't know what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. So I majored in history and French. And then when I finished college, I still didn't know what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Um, and so I ended up joining the Peace Corps, um, which in the US is a way to live overseas and do service. And so I was an English teacher in a little country called Eritrea uh, in the Horn of Africa, which a lot of people haven't heard of. And if you haven't heard of it, you should go pull out a map when this is over. Um, and I was an English teacher in a small village. And one of the things they said to us, the government, because we really worked for the government, um, was could you try to keep the girls in school? A lot of the girls are dropping out when they get to puberty. Now, the main reason they gave us was that they were getting married. The families didn't want to spend the money on educating girls when they could be doing other things. So for the two years I lived in this village, we focused on the girls and the boys. Um, and I remember noticing girls leaving and just assumed it was marriage. 
Um, but I also noticed that the school that I taught in um, had no toilets for the kids. There was nowhere for them to go. Some walked an hour to get to school every day. They sat in the classrooms. They almost never got up, maybe once for sort of recess as they, you know, a break. Um, and so 15 years later, um, when I went back to school and decided to get a doctoral degree, I was really curious to understand girls' education. Why are girls still far behind boys um, in a lot of parts of the world? Um, and what are the reasons? And it was in 2004 that I started to look at the issue more deeply um, and realized that there was this thing about toilets um, and periods, and there was almost no data. And if there's no data, it's really hard to get governments and donors and people to spend money on something. Um, and so that's when I started looking at this issue, doing research with girls in Tanzania. Um, I probably, like many people in this call, really like to be active. I like to hear from girls themselves. And so I designed methods that really had the girls teaching me and not me just trying to gather from them. And so they wrote stories about their first periods. They shared the questions they had. They drew the perfect toilet for a girl in school. And so that was really the start. Um, but when I designed that study in 2006, I thought, you know what, these girls, if they're like the girls, I was in Tanzania, but I thought if they're like the girls in Eritrea, and frankly, some girls in the US, um, they probably don't know about their bodies. Um, and so shouldn't we develop some kind of book for them, like a Judy Bloom? I don't know about other parts of the world, but in America, we grow up or did, I may be too old now, this book, the Judy Bloom series, which taught you about your bodies. So I thought, let's maybe do a book that captures girls' first period stories and also the, the learning that they need about body change and for just for the young adolescents, not for older adolescents. And that's when I decided to start the nonprofit Grow and Know because I couldn't do puberty books as a professor. You're not supposed to do that, but I was gonna be a professor. And so I just started doing both at the same time. Um, and then for the last 15, 12 years as a professor and with a nonprofit, I've in the nonprofit world done the books. And then in my professorial world, I've ended up doing other research and projects uh, with the UN and in emergencies and sort of other topical areas just this past summer with homeless population sort of just trying to understand the range of issues around menstruation and menstrual equity, as you said. There's a very long answer. <laughs> we loved it. It's still, that's yeah. really cool. And it's awesome that you've been able to balance both being a professor and being in a nonprofit, which is super awesome. All right, so my next question, so you've answered like two questions in one, which is awesome. Uh, basically, as you mentioned, menstrual health and inequity is a topic which really recently has begun to receive the attention, I guess, that it deserves. Um, to make sure that the audience kind of understands what it means to have inequities in men menstrual or uh, menstrual health, MHM, could you maybe give us some like basic information of what it is and why it's such a big issue? Yeah, sure. So what's really interesting is the issue of menstruation and the way in which it was a challenge or is a challenge for girls really started out around 2004 when I started to do my research as well. Um, and the focus was really on, because partly because that's what we were, who was interested, what we were looking at, and also where there was funding to enable us to study it. We were looking at girls in school, primarily in lower income parts of the world. So I was in East Africa. As more people started to look at it, we added in some other parts of Africa, some countries in Asia, but really up until about five years ago. So for the span of 2004, five, up until maybe four years ago, it was really all research and advocacy building in lower income regions of the world. Um, and I think what happened, which doesn't happen often enough, is the high income parts of the world suddenly realized, wait a minute, um, here we are saying it's a problem over there. Have we looked at our own backyard, as you might say? What's going on right here in the richer parts of the world? Have we actually solved this issue? Do we even understand this issue? Um, and so, a number of very charismatic individuals, I think, in uh, the US and the UK got sort of became quite passionate about this topic, started writing about it, um, started sort of calling out the inequities around the cost of sanitary products, accessibility to sanitary or menstrual products, whatever they are, um, the tax on products in, in many parts of the world. But actually, Kenya, you know, 12 years ago got rid of the tax on menstrual products. So again, other parts of the world were way ahead of us here in, in the US particularly, 
in thinking about this issue, these inequities. And so um, what's happened in recent years, so what's overseas, what's continued to happen is attention for the issue. We need to address the stigma around it, the ways in which um, those who menstruate are treated differently, have to feel embarrassed and shameful or are made to feel that way, um, have to manage potentially without adequate toilets or water um, or, or any kind of product, even a cloth, if that's what their preference is. Um, so there's been a focus on, on schools, school girls. There's been a focus on um, emergency context, which I can talk about later. And then here in the wealthier parts of the world, the focus has really been on the cost of products and access to products for low income populations and the inequity that um, people who have periods need to pay for products and get taxed on it in a way that those who don't have periods don't get taxed on something else that's a function of basic necessity. Um, and so that's sort of been the movement in the richer parts of the world. Um, and then just in sort of recent years, there have been policies enacted to provide free products to pub in select states and cities, to public schools, to those who are incarcerated, and to individuals who are homeless. Now, I don't know that those policies are actually well-funded and or being implemented and monitored the way they should be. That's another conversation. Um, but that's really been where the focus has been um, in the US in the last couple of years. And so that's why last summer we did a study in New York City um, with individuals who are homeless to understand their needs living on the street and in shelters. And I think this issue is, is being raised a lot now because of COVID um, and the implications of people losing jobs. Are they able to afford products? People losing their houses. Do they have safe places to change and manage their periods? Um, and the only critique I would make of the menstrual equity agenda, and my team talks about this a lot, is everyone focuses on products and on stigma, which are incredibly important. But the very unsexy topic of toilets and where you throw away used materials, trash cans, you know, disposal units, it's so much harder to get attention. Um, and yet it sort of goes hand in hand with the other aspects of managing your period. So we always like to talk about it. Managing your period is not about one thing. It is about a package of things that you need to have for, you know, your own sense of dignity. So. Definitely. And I, I think that's really interesting that you brought the disposal thing, because I think that's something like no one ever discusses. It's always about the stigma yeah. and fixing that stigma is the key to um, addressing inequity. So thank you. That was, I, I think I'm like, I'm learning, I guess, um, about the topic. Well, it's good timing because last week, our team, we partnered with the International Rescue Committee. We got funding from the US government that works on displaced populations. And we worked with 16 other humanitarian response organizations and we launched a new compendium on menstrual product disposal, waste management, and laundering, which is sort of 50 pages of what people are doing around the world to address this totally overlooked issue with examples and innovation, including because in most cultures, and if you stop and think about everybody on this call right now, all 22 of you, um, does anyone else in your household ever see your used product? I'm gonna guess the answer is a big no. And is that something you think about every time you change if you're not flushing it, which is bad for the plumbing. Um, and so, you know, learning, one of the things that was our favorite discovery um, was in the refugee camps in Bangladesh, um, which is the design of a chute that is attached to the side of the toilet. So women who don't want someone to see that there's no trash can or they're embarrassed for someone even to see there's something or they think they'll be cursed if someone sees their used material, they plop it into the chute, which is why we need engineers, we need all sorts of people to help with menstruation. And the chute goes into a bucket outside that gets emptied by special people or into a waste pit. Um, and it takes away that intense cultural fears around someone seeing your used material. So um, we need very innovative people working on this to tackle sort of that aspect as well. But the compendium is free online. So if you're as excited about disposal and waste management and laundering as we are, you can find it and check it out. Awesome, definitely. And when we send an email at the end, like a follow back email, I'll definitely ask you for the link so okay. I can send that over to other people. All right, so my next question. Uh, so in many, as you mentioned, in developing nations, this was a topic a lot of people asked. Um, as you mentioned, menstruation is a really 
taboo or impure topic due to a lot of cultural values about it. So I think you talked about this a little more, but how important is education, I guess, in, disp in dispelling that stigma um, typically associated with like menstruation? So excellent question. And it reminds me of my graduate students at Mailman. And I think do all of you, all the participants, I just want to check something, are able to raise your hand. They're able to raise their hand if I ask a question. Yeah, they can. And they can put questions in the can as well. Okay. Well, no, I want to see, I want you to raise your hand. How many people, participants, if you're not shy, if you can see the feature, if you have the feature to raise your hand, how many people, when they get up from a room, a living room, a classroom, a meeting room, when they have their period, wave their pad or tampon in the air publicly as they go walk to the bathroom. So either nobody knows how to raise the hand function or nobody doesn't. So the reason I asked that question is my graduate students at Columbia, a few years ago, I was giving a lecture at the very end of my course, because I don't really talk about it in the course I was teaching about menstruation and stigma, per your very good question. Um, and some of my grad students who are in their 20s, most of them are American, said, well, we don't have stigma here anymore. It's much better. I said, really? I haven't seen anybody's pad or tampon in this class in the last, you know, 12 weeks. How many of you wave it around? And then they all got very quiet. Um, and so I think, you know, it's alive and well in all parts of the world that we're supposed to hide this. Um, and so absolutely, it's very strong in different parts of the world. It's, there are more restrictions in certain parts of the world, but I think it is overwhelmingly an issue we need to tackle everywhere. But just to maybe speak more specifically, um, I think universally, not everywhere, but very generally one finds in, in the countries, for example, where we've done puberty books, which is eight countries in Africa and Asia, and now we're working on one actually in the US, um, girls are taught to hide it, they don't get enough information about it, it's sort of something maybe their mothers or grandmothers or aunties told them, maybe their friends say something. Oftentimes teachers, even if it's in the syllabus, will skip the topic because they're not comfortable. Um, and so education is a huge issue in terms of just even knowing their own body, forget stigma, just so they know it's normal and natural. And that's why our puberty books, which if you want, you can send that too, they're all downloadable and free, all talk about how your period is normal and natural and you should feel good about it and just learn to manage it and not see it as this terrible thing. And one of the quotes that really stuck with me from Ethiopia after we did our girls book there and then we do some evaluation was a quote from a girl who said, I've learned that this is not a curse um, from God that I get my period. And um, I don't have to hide it from my mother because in Ethiopia in particular, we found there's a lot of secrecy. Um, it's just very conservative culture as compared to, for example, Tanzania where there's secrecy, but not as conservative most um, of the ethnic groups. Um, so I would say universally, we find girls are taught to hide it. Some girls, and, and the other thing which I found very interesting and in, in a lot of the African countries and Asian countries where we've worked is the girls don't learn anything till they get their first period. So there's no preparation. And so some of them may learn afterwards. Someone, they may go to somebody or somebody notices they have a stain and teaches them something, but they themselves, I think people are afraid to tell them anything or don't think they should tell them anything um, until they've had their first period. But then this poor child sees blood, thinks she's dying, doesn't know what's happening, is afraid to talk to anybody. And so part of what we try to advocate with our puberty books is they get distributed before a girl gets her first period. And so she may not entirely understand it the first time she reads the book, but then at least she knows it's coming uh, and she's not as afraid. Um, in doing our research in the US, what we found is a lot of girls similar, and particularly certain um, sort of ethnic groups or maybe immigrant groups, similarly didn't know enough. There, there maybe got, there was in the US, um, puberty education or sex ed is only mandated in half our states. And sex ed doesn't necessarily even include puberty information. So even here, girls are not getting it. So um, I think the last thing I'd say about the stigma and then to get to finish the education part of your question, when I went to Nepal a couple years ago to speak at a big menstruation meeting, it was a very good experience for me because I don't think having mostly worked in Africa, we had done a book in Pakistan, but I didn't go to Pakistan. We had a Pakistani team and it was very conservative there. 
but when I but when I went to Nepal, it was when I really came to appreciate that a number of the Asian countries have much stricter restrictions about where you sleep and what you can eat or not eat and not being able to pray. And and what gets in the media a lot is the menstrual huts and this thing called chaupuri in far west Nepal. But but the point that my Nepali colleagues who work on menstruation and I've been trying to make is that's the extreme. But the everyday girl and woman or uh, living in Kathmandu, the capital, also may have to go sleep somewhere else, may not be supposed to cook, may not be allowed to go to prayer. Um, and so it's, there is sort of, and it's normalized that that's to be expected because you're dirty, um, you're not clean. Um, and so I think we have a lot of work to do on stigma um, and the restrictions with the one caveat I would make, which is very powerful learning from a, a, a video that a former doctoral a student, doctoral committee I was on made with girls in far west Nepal, that some of them actually liked going to the menstrual hut because it was the only time they didn't have to do their chores and they could hang out with their friends if they also had their periods. And there's some anthropology around that. So I think we have to be really careful when we study this issue, not to say, oh, if they have to go to a hut, that's bad. Now, there may be problems with that, but we have to understand the people's experience and their own preferences. So I think education, to your question, is a like critically important way um, for girls to understand, not be afraid, not be ashamed. But it's also parents, it's also families, it's the boys, it's the healthcare workers. When I was in Tanzania in 2006, the number of people who told me, well, the doctor said that when I have a baby, my period will stop being painful. So basically, the doctor's encouraging them to have babies. You know, so not great. Um, so I think, and a nurse we interviewed in 2006 said, oh, it didn't even occur to me to talk to girls about this issue. And so I think that, that we need to educate everybody. The healthcare workers need to do a better job of engaging. The girls need to learn more and the boys. The teachers need to stop being uncomfortable so they can actually, parents need to be able to. So, um, so I think education is huge, but we also, there's a lot of people who fit in the category um, of who needs to be educated. So definitely, and thank you. You like answered all your answering all our questions so well that we're like, God, we don't even need some questions anymore. But thank you so much. And I definitely think, um, like as a Pakistani myself, like I definitely think there's a lot of like it's not something you can talk about. And there's so many like myths. I guess like one myth that's really common that we hear as a kid is that. Um, you can't um, take a shower or bathe during the time you're on your um, cycle because it slows down your cycle and then it ends up being longer. And when I ended up somehow searching that, it wasn't true. And I was like shocked. I was like, wait. Wow. Uh, so definitely, yeah. I definitely agree with you on that. Yeah, also yeah. And we have a Pakistan book, so you should check it out. I mean, one of the things that only happened in Pakistan, which is very interesting to me, and again, I think this is parts of the population. This is, of course, not all of Pakistan is that our, when our team went to the schools, some of the teachers said, well, girls don't need to learn about this. And we're like, but of course they do. <laughs> so it was the first time we had that sort of resistance um, from teachers. Because usually the teachers would say, oh, thank God you're doing this because we don't want to have to talk about it. Um, and you know, the teachers came around and I think they appreciated the book. And we were it was a very carefully done book because we got SIN government approval and that took a lot of negotiation and we had to take out parts of the book and that's another conversation. Um, but, um, but yeah, yeah. So you'll enjoy the book, I think. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll definitely ask you for the link so I can just send it to everyone who wants it. Awesome. So my next question, you've tackled a little bit about it um, before, but what are some really common misconceptions, I guess, that you've seen arise when discussing like menstrual health or inequities in both developed and developing regions? Um, it's funny you say that. So it, this probably isn't what you were thinking of. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of myths um, that come up. In, and I've always been fascinated by things like if you look at the African continent, it is an enormous continent with such diversity, even within a given country. Uh, it's just, it, it is an immense, complex place. And yet the girls in Tanzania, on, in East Africa and the girls in Ghana in West Africa could not be further apart on the continent. Both told us, so this isn't so much a misconception as I find it fascinating how these beliefs are similar, that if a dog got your used pad or if somebody saw your used pad, you would be infertile. 
Um, and so what I find fascinating is how is it that that exact same belief is existing in completely different societies? And it's also about sort of, you know, when I would ask the adults about it, they're like, oh, we're just trying to teach girls to keep clean. We don't actually believe that if somebody sees your pad, you'll be infertile. But I actually think they do believe it, you know, and that is part of, you know, the mythology around menstrual blood as powerful. I mean, per what you were told um, growing up, you know, in a Pakistani family. So um, it, it's very interesting. But one of the things that came up yesterday, so we did this study last summer. There's very little data, and if you don't have data and evidence, it's hard again to get advocacy, solid advocacy that convinces governments and donors to spend money on a problem. So we did this study last summer with the homeless um, in New York City, with street and sheltered homeless. And yesterday we presented our findings to this huge um, homeless group. Um, that's very a wonderful advocate group that had helped us gain access for interviews. And we were telling them, because we looked at toilets, and one of the number one recommendations from the homeless individuals um, was public toilets should have free products. Um, shelters where they're staying should have freely accessible products. Um, because the way it works now in most shelters, we learned, is one, they may not even tell people they have products, which they may not have them, but sometimes they have them, they just don't tell them. And then there's what we're calling in our analysis a gatekeeper. There's somebody guarding the products. Um, and what this person on the coalition said to us is, and that presents a barrier because that gatekeeper maybe is a man, maybe it's somebody who has other responsibilities and the person living in the shelter isn't comfortable with them. Maybe that gatekeeper is often positioned at the front desk and someone doesn't want to go ask for products at the front desk and they usually only give them one or two at a time. I mean, who can get through a period with two products? Um, so there's lots of challenges. But the point, when we were sharing this yesterday, the coalition said, well, the problem is that the city who funds and the way the shelters run, they're probably afraid to just have the products out because someone's just going to take them all. And then they're, you know, then they're not going to have anybody for anybody. So, so that's probably their rationale, which is not a wrong rationale to be concerned about. Um, but the, the master student who did the research with us said, you know, a lot of the women talked about this one women's shelter in Brooklyn that had a basket outside the toilet and anybody could take whatever products they needed. And they were just free for people to take and didn't ask, you could just get them. And the point that someone else in my team made um, was, you know, if people are taking a lot of tampons, they probably need those tampons or those pads. It's not like this is gold that they're going to market on the street. These are not cigarettes. You know, these are a basic necessity. Um, yeah, sure, maybe they'll barter them because they need something else. But most likely, if someone's taking a lot, it's because they have a heavy period, they need a lot, or their friend needs them. And so, um, and the same misconception came up. So a lot of college campuses in the US, I don't know about other parts of the world, a lot of students have become very active around trying to have free products um, in college bathrooms, which is incredible. So we did this study this past year. We picked four schools and we interviewed students in administration who had launched some kind of period product effort at their university. And at every school, it seemed like, uh, I, I did some of the interviews, not all of them, um, the administration had said, you can't put free products because girls will take them all. And I think this has come up in high schools too, where girls have tried very hard um, to make them available. Um, and and what's always ha seems to happen is maybe a couple extra get taken at the beginning and then they just become like toilet paper. They're there. If you want them, you take them. If you don't want them. And so that's an issue where I think there's a misconception that oh my God, free products are all going to get stolen and they're not, which is just wrong. And, you know, so you end up hindering people from having a basic necessity, you know. So I don't know if that's really what you were thinking about, but that's a misconception that I have found interesting that seems to be coming up, um, you know, more in, in, more in our studies here than overseas. So. Awesome. No, you definitely answered my question. Uh, all right, so we'll move on to the next question and then, okay, we're running good on time. So after a few more questions, we'll be able to open it up to some general questions I got before the session and some questions people sent in the Q&A box. All right, so um, okay. this question uh, was something that multiple people had asked about beforehand. So what are some of the main obstacles you face when trying to promote, I guess, widespread menstrual health awareness and the fact like raising awareness that it is an inequity and it's an urgent problem that needs to be addressed 
um, I guess both in developed and developing regions and I guess what strategies do you think have worked um, in addressing that? So great question. All your questions are great. Um, so one of the obstacles that I think has been around forever um, and we're doing our best with it, but I don't think it's going to go away. But I think the more people who get engaged, I hope all, however, 33 of you get engaged on this, um, is that it's not important. It's not a priority. So the health people, and I'm a public health person and I'm a trained nurse, so I, I see it all directions. Um, resources are limited. You know, maybe in the world of Coca-Cola production, resources are not limited. But in the world of public health, as we're seeing right now with COVID, there are limited resources to go around. It has not been a priority. So when there's limited resources, understandably and appropriately, there is a lot of competition for those resources. And you have to make a really good case for why um, your, your interest area is deserving of some of those limited resources, whether it's health or education or whatever the issue is. So one of the challenges with menstrual health and hygiene is people saying, nobody's dying. If nobody's dying and nobody's getting sick, this is not a priority, you know? And so the way people have responded to that is interesting. You have some people trying to argue that if you don't have adequate products, you get bad infections. However, we have no evidence on that. We have like one study, two studies, and I don't think we're gonna have more. Because I think, I think what really happens is if you can't dry or use product, or um, you have to use a wet, you know, you may get fungal infections. I think that is possible, and it can be very uncomfortable, which is terrible, and you shouldn't have to deal with any of those. But we're not gonna be able to say you get some terrible, terrible, life-threatening infection. Um, which I think people really wanna be able to say, not because they want people to have terrible infections, but it makes it sound more compelling. So the health argument, like I was coming back from refugee camp, in Tanzania a few years ago and somebody from the British government was behind me um, and they were having a conversation and we just you're standing in line at the airport this little airport in the middle of nowhere oh what are you doing here what are you doing here and I said well we were doing this pilot project and menstruation and emergencies oh well can't you just give them cloth like that's not it's not a priority you know it's not a real health issue and you're just like a cloth is not enough and it is an important issue so so that is a challenge so one could go at it by trying to argue it's an, you know, a big health issue. Another way of making the, the health argument that some of us have included, because I do think it's very real, is the anxiety and stress, which if we are learning anything from COVID, it is how important mental health is around the world for all of us. Um, and I do think, and there is a growing literature, the anxiety and stress, um, the confusion, all of those emotions that you get not being able to manage, if you have heavy periods, if you have a menstrual disorder, is very, very real, not well measured, so it's harder to make the case, um, but that is a compelling argument, I think. Another challenge, the same way, a number of years ago, I was on a panel, uh, I think I was talking about the puberty books, it was, it was at an education conference, because so, one of the things we've tried to do is talk to health people, education people, water sanitation people, you know, we're gonna speak at a law conference next spring around menstruation and the law to get at some of the homeless and the transgender issues. Um, so I'm, I'm waiting to get up at the panel and there's someone from the US government sitting in the audience. And all of us are gonna talk about periods and girls in school. And, why, and I say girls in school because I'm talking about Africa where primarily girls are the population and the terminology and the conceptual. Um, if I were in the US or countries that are more inclusive around language and include, you know, I, it would be all people of period. So my apologies for saying girls and focusing on girls. But I was about to get on a panel, it was maybe five or six years ago, and this person from the US government who funds global work said to me, or me and my colleague at Save the Children, I think, well, can you show that if girls don't have toilets or you don't do something on periods, that they do worse in school? Can you make a case that this is bad for their outcomes, their performance in school? Now, I'm not a violent person, but I sort of wanted to hit this person on the head, but, but I didn't. And I thought to myself, who in America has to prove that they get a better exam score because our bathroom has a toilet with a door and a lock versus not having it? I mean, that is so insane to me, the sort of gender discrimination around and the equity issues that I have to prove on an ex that in my exam scores are better. How do you even measure that? Like, 
maybe you got your period, maybe you miss school every, I mean, I don't think attendance and dropout are good measures for periods anyway. That's a whole other conversation. And we're trying to move people to other measures that we think are more useful and meaningful. Um, so I think that is the ongoing challenge with periods is articulating why it matters, why it's a priority, why, because if you say, I, I, we also, there's another conference, some colleagues and I presented at around that time at the Tropical Medicine Conference. I don't even know how we got into that conference. It was not my idea, but somewhere we're there with all these tropical disease experts talking about infectious disease and we do a session on periods. And someone in the audience said, this is all well and good, but the argument your colleague made, because someone on the panel said, it's an issue of rights, dignity and rights. And he said, that's all well and good. That's not going to convince the donors. You know, it's not going to convince the Ministry of Finance. He needs to know why period education or toilets versus textbooks. Why toilets versus classrooms? I mean, these are very real questions. In Africa, when I was in Tanzania back in 2006, they said, we're supposed to have enough toilets, but we don't have enough classrooms. What? So we chose classrooms as with our budget. So I think until we've, and this is why we've been trying to improve and expand the measures to show the impact and to make the argument for it. I think that has been our biggest challenge um, in this agenda is convincing people. Um, even one of my oldest, like a mentor and professor and now colleague of mine who does emergency work, you know, I just stay away from him on this topic because he has a class where he, you know, his point is this is not as important as cholera um, in an epidemic, in an emergency. And I said, I'm not saying this is important as cholera, but if a woman or girl in an emergency cannot go stand in line for five hours to get their distribution because they have their period, that's life and death. That distribution is their food. If they can't walk the distance and stand in that long line to get water for their family, that's life and death. So, um, so I think helping to, convince the world and that this is a priority remains, um, I think it's getting better, um, but um, that, that I would say is our biggest challenge or a big challenge, so. Awesome, all right, so before I open it up to the Q&A part, um, you mentioned earlier about some like not measuring dropout rates um, as something that can measure um, menstrual inequities um, and that's something like I didn't know so could you maybe like i guess talk about what types of measures yeah. should are more accurate than rather than looking at those um rates yeah. yeah so this has been we actually had a meeting in geneva to try and tackle this last march um it's very interesting people understandably it gets back to what i said a little while ago about a compelling argument people want to say girls with their periods drop out girls with their periods don't go to school and for sure, some girls don't go to school when they have their period. If there's not adequate toilet, if there's not, if they don't have, sorry, the construction outside of it, so you can hear how loud it is. Anyway, um, but from what we've seen, and even when I tried back in 2006, I was all gung-ho to make a point about attendance and dropout when I was in Northern Tanzania. And I got those attendance records and I pulled them out and I looked month through month at the schools where I did my study and they were impossible. Anyone who works in education knows one, attendance records are very poorly kept. They might be kept by a student. Somebody might get someone to say they're there when they're not there be, or that they're there when, so they don't get punished because there's still corporal punishment in a lot of places. Um, so the, the records in the schools are not good. Anybody knows that who works in education. You cannot count on the school records. So there's problem number one. Problem number two, I'm guessing, and I think a lot of other people feel this way, that it's girls who are newly menstruating who really struggle. Older girls, if they're resilient, I think get the hang of it and they find a way. It's not easy. If there's no toilets, it's a huge issue. If they have a heavy period, they're definitely not going to school, but it's really the younger ones. Um, but younger girls often have irregular periods. You know, I don't know about you, but maybe they go five months and then they go two months and then they go eight months. The first two years are irregular. So trying to even capture a pattern around their school going or not, um, or for example, what I found in Tanzania is girls would leave at noon or they'd leave and come back. So that gets totally missed by any kind of record keeping, whether you're doing a study or, um, so, so trying to track attendance is really hard. And also from what we have learned is they may be missing some school, but not the amount, um, that's really going to sound compelling. And so our concern is if you really focus on 
attendance or even drop out. Girls drop out for so many reasons. They drop out to get married. They drop out because the family can't pay the school fees. They drop out because they're scared of walking to school. They, you know, there's sort of a host of reasons. And I think the way I came away from my research in 2006, concluding, unless it's from a tr an ethnic or tribal group, like for example, in Tanzania, there's a group called the Zaramo and there's the Maasai. They have very clear rituals. You get your period, you get married. I mean, the government tries to control it. They don't, it's only so much controlled. So I think unless you're in a cultural or religious environment where at menarche, that's it. And it's very, which clearly I think Pakistan, some places that still exists quite strongly. For everybody else, let's say, I think your period is like the straw that broke the camel's back. I don't know if people know that saying, but we say it here in the US. It's like, there's five problems already. And then managing your period is one more problem. So I just think it's very hard to you say drop out, period dropout. I think that's a very hard direct link to make. Um, I think for sure some girls do. We've had girls tell us that in countries around the world, but I just think it's a harder argument uh, to make. What we are trying to do is say, um, it's also not the outcomes that a lot of these countries are trying to measure. They're trying to measure school completion or um, child marriage or pregnancy. So, so periods fall lower down in that chain of measurement when those are the outcomes that a country cares most about. Things we wish people would measure and capture are, does a girl participate or not? You know, in a lot of these countries, you have to stand up when you answer a question. You're expected to answer questions and to stand up. If you're worried you have a stain on your skirt, you're not standing up. Um, you have to, you know, so participation engagement in the classroom. How well are you able to concentrate when you have your period? Are you constantly worried you're going to have a stain or someone's going to smell you tucked under the bench with you? Um, anxiety levels, sort of how do you feel? Are you anxious the entire time you're in school on those days? Um, anemia, you know, are you more like if you're heavy, if you're bleeding heavily and you're not getting enough meat in your diet or some kind of, you know, iron? So I think there's a broader array. I can send you a link to a report we wrote um, there's a broader array of measures that we think would be a lot more meaningful about the experience of someone who menstruates um, than sort of those two, which are very fixated, uh, people are fixated on. So. Awesome. No, that definitely answered my question. All right. So I think we've, we've reached 442, so I think we can um, move on to the questions. So I have a few of my team members in here right now and they have their own questions and they combined it with a few other questions that we received. So I'll have them speak. Um, Asya, do you wanna go first and then Dala, you can go. Okay, hi. So hi. I saw that you wrote an article about periods and how they can make life for refugees a bit more difficult. Could you talk to us about the struggles that the refugees face and how that they, like, what they could do to face it, I guess, like solutions? Yep, absolutely. And I can also send you another link to circulate. So it's a great question. You, you have really an excellent roster of questions today. Um, I'm going to expand it a little to the world of humanitarian uh, response, just as sort of for the others on the call who may not be aware. So when we're talking about emergencies, we are talking about refugees. So like the Syrian refugees in Lebanon and Jordan, um, the Rohingya in Bangladesh. And we're talking about internally displaced populations, IDPs. Um, in fact, there are more internally displaced people right now than refugees. So we were in Myanmar or Burma, whatever you call it, a number of years ago, visiting the Rohingya in camps there. We were in Northern Nigeria last year because of Boko Haram. There's huge camps in Northern Nigeria. So, um, so when we're thinking about, and I, and I mentioned that because that makes it an enormous number. We're talking 26 million people. Now, when I write an op-ed, I don't usually write internally displaced and refugees because the average person will be like, what is this person talking about? Refugees is just a much more frequently used term, um, but I think it's important to recognize that there's both the internally displaced because it's more of them um, and the refugees. And, and the reason and the different terminology, this is for when you're in grad school and decide to focus on this, um, is related to which UN bodies and others can respond to support them. So UNHCR, which is a very famous part of the UN that does refugee response, cannot help internally displaced. It's maddening. So, and then for example, the US government, the funding we got from their emergency component, this one part of them could only be used for IDPs. So, um, so just it gets very complicated in the world of humanitarian health. However, 
More interestingly, back to periods, there's over 26 million displaced and refugee sort of girls and women around the world, which is a vast number. So again, a great question. Um, and what we found is a number of years ago is there wasn't, we were concerned there was, so when, it, when there's an emergency, whoop, all these NGOs, everybody swoops in to try and do something, hopefully. Um, they all come with their own guidance. They work together. The water sanitation people work together. The health people work together. The education people work together. The camp management people, if it's camps. So there is an organized response, but every organization tends to have its own guidance. Those clusters, the water sanitation cluster, the health, they have their guidance. And we started to think, is menstruation on these guidance documents? Are they adequately addressing menstruation? Now we knew from a paper I, re I did years ago that UNHCR, many years ago, Ago, like 2008 I think had a mandate we will distribute sanitary pads to all the refugees now remember that means we're only helping the refugees that doesn't mean we're helping the IDPs um, but but sanitary pads for us are one piece of a much bigger like operation that needs to happen you need to address toilets and bathing and disposal and water you need to address information some of these emergencies are six months some of them are 20 years you're going to have a lot of girls getting their first period and not knowing what's happening to their body. So you really need information. Maybe you're giving them a menstrual pad. Maybe they've never seen a menstrual pad before. So they need education on how to use what you're giving them and if they're okay with it. Um, so we decided after a review, a desk review, that there wasn't any good guidance out there. Um, so we got funding from the British government and we partnered as a university with the International Rescue Committee, which is a big NGO that does emergency response because you want to work with people who do the response. You want to study it and come up with a solution, but you really need the people who do it, who understand it um, and to be respected. So we spent two and a half years. And one of the things that's very important to me when we develop any kind of guidance document and when I do my puberty books um, is to be as collaborative as possible to put your ego at the door, the I did this, I did this, and be like the only way this guidance document or this puberty book is going to be used, which is really what we're all trying to do, is if everybody who needs to be in the room is in the room. Um, and so from the beginning of our emergencies project, it was 2015, we put out a call to the entire human engineering response community. We said, we are doing this. We want to do this with you. Please help us and please send us documents, please tell us who to interview, please come to a workshop where we go through our draft, please review what we come up with, please give us criticisms, and so on. So it took us two and a half years and lots, we had 50 plus people review it, um, but we came up with a guide, it's called the MHM and Emergencies Toolkit. Again, it's free online, there's a big one, there's a little one, there's some infographics, um, and it's a, it's a, um, 27 humanitarian response organizations, UN agencies, NGOs, donors co-published it with us, which was really important. If they co-publish it, they're more likely to use it and put it on their website, and then the people inside are gonna know about it. In that. Um, and it has chapters on all the relevant sections. So we knew emergency people are not gonna read a 100-page guide. They're gonna say, I'm a water and sanitation person, what's the chapter on water sanitation? So it actually ended up being much longer than it needed to be because we thought no one, everyone's only gonna read their chapter. So we had to keep repeating like, this is how you train your staff. This is how you do an assessment because we were afraid they weren't gonna to refer to the sections that said that. But anyway, if you look through it to that great question, it talks about where do you begin? What are the questions to ask? How do you train your staff? A lot of, oftentimes in an emergency, there's some international people, oftentimes in the olden days, now it's changing, the water sanitation people were all men. They don't have their periods. They're not intentionally overlooking it. They just don't have periods, so they don't think about it. Um, and then the local staff are often people from the country where the emergency is or where the refugees are living. Maybe they've never talked about periods publicly. You know, maybe that's not culturally okay. So, you, so we have a section on training staff, sensitizing them to talk about it, knowing if it should only be women talking to women, like how should they manage it? And then what should the water toilet people do? What should the education people, what should the health people and so on. So, so that guidance document is out there since 2017. Um, but it was in doing that guidance document that we realized no one wants to talk about disposal and waste management. They all want to give out products and they'll talk about toilets, but that really sexy topic of where are you throwing away the used products or how are you washing and drying them? Because a lot of people are living in maybe one tent with 10 people. How do you wash a product, a pad 
or cloth when there's people all around you all the time? And where do you dry it? So we got this follow on funding and this is what we released last week to look at this very narrow part of it. It's important but narrow, which is what I mentioned earlier, which is the compendium just on disposal, waste management and um, laundering. So, um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but, it, but sort of that's the realm of what we've been doing. I think we have a long way to go back to the same thing we talked about earlier, which is emergency people saying, why is this a priority? People need vitamin A, they need measles vaccines. And we say they need to be able to go outside of their tent, get water, get food. They need to not be ashamed and embarrassed and anxious um, for their mental health. Um, being displaced is very mentally taxing. Um, so again, this is sort of, it's so, but you know, inch by inch, hopefully we will get there. For sure. Um, and yeah, that's, I think you definitely went into great depth about that. So Asya, I think she, I, I definitely answered your question. Um, all right. So my next, our next question is from also another of my team members. Her name's Dala. Dala, do you want to go ahead? Hi. So Hi. Um, Dala Shatila. So while I was looking over the GATE program, I found some really great information on menstrual mm -hmm. washing and disposal. Could you discuss some methods which are often incorporated around the world to help women manage their menstruation discreetly and dispose feminine products? And is there any concern over like sustainability? So I think this speaks a little bit to the compendium, which we released last week, which was intended for emergencies, but we think it's actually quite relevant for development contexts. Um, I think what, what we know is, how, it depends if a woman uses a cloth, a girl or a woman, or anyone with their period, uses a cloth, a reusable pad, or a disposable pad. And then there's women who use tampons um, or other things. But generally in the lower income parts of the world, we find it's cloth, reusable pad, or disposable pad are the main things that are used. Um, for cloths and reusable pads, um, it's, it's about laundering. Where do they wash it? How do they wash it? Where do they dry it? Um, and privacy is the real issue. Um, stories sort of from very different age groups and parts of the world are around girls and women hiding their cloth under the bed, you know, at top of the latrine, you know, under a wall, like all these places because of this sort of belief that shows up in so many places that if someone sees your used menstrual cloth, you will be cursed. Now, to be honest, if again, if I did a hand raising exercise with people who were on this call, I'm, I'm almost 100% positive that if I said, if you used a reusable pad or cloth and you washed it, would you hang it up in the middle of your family's house? Um, I'm guessing nobody would raise their hand. So really, it's just one of these things people are very private about. Um, in the boarding schools where we've done research, what the girls do, and in some of the camps, the displacement or refugee camps, um, they will put a cloth on top of their menstrual cloth so that it's, so it doesn't get as much sunlight as we would like but that's their way of driving it and having some privacy. Um, so the laundering and drying is an issue. And one of the things we recommend in emergencies is that girls and women get their own little bucket. Because a lot of families, there's only one bucket for doing the laundry and they don't want them washing stained underwear and or cloth in the same bucket because of beliefs as the other laundry is done. So, so again, that's why there's a whole list of things somebody might need um, to really manage comfortably. Um, in developing, in development in sort of non-emergency context, I think the laundering and drying issue is the same because maybe people live in a slum and they all live together in one tiny house. So again, the privacy, the water, the bucket is the same issue. Um, in other places, um, I think they throw it into rivers, they bury it in the forest. It's really not, not great environmental solutions. Um, what we found with the Rohingya, both those living in Myanmar in the camps and then in living in the refugee camps they were in in Bangladesh, because we visited both, they kept trying to bury. Now, the problem with burying them in the camps in Myanmar was it was a flood zone. So the next time it flooded, you were gonna have a lot of floating pads or cloths, not ideal, hygienically or emotionally. The other thing is they would get up early, they didn't want anyone to see them bury. So they would go out at night or before dawn, which is a safety risk for them. You know, they're vulnerable. In the camps in Bangladesh, they were trying to bury them as well because that has been what they had been doing. And the camps in Bangladesh were the most crowded refugee camps I've ever seen in my life. There was no space for burying. 
Um, and so that's why these NGOs, the international, the IFRC, the Red Cross, the Bangladesh Red Crescent Society, the Danish Red Cross, Oxfam, others, were trying to come up with these innovative, and MSF, Doctors Without Borders, these innovative shoots and um, other kinds of disposal mechanisms to help persuade women um, and girls to throw them somewhere where they could be managed and didn't end up getting buried in sort of all the tiny little crevices around their houses because that also had flooding, major flooding issues, that area. It's not a good place to be living. It's at sea level and it's a major issue there. So I don't know. It, it is, I will say this, Dala, it is a totally untapped issue. We have been trying for years to get funding, to get the sanitary pad companies to talk to the sanitation engineers. I mean, because if you look at these rapidly growing massive cities, no one's dealing with this issue, but there's more and more pads um, of, of all different kinds. So I think it's one of those things, it is so not a sexy topic. Trying to convince people to talk about it is really hard. So I'm glad you asked about it. Um, but I think it's one of those things we really need people to take on and tackle um, uh, to, it, yeah, I hope you do it. All right, awesome. So I'm going to show the poll results now as we reach our closing. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll share this with you so you guys can see it. So we have pretty good diversity. Um, no one's from Australia during this session, which is okay, but we have a good <laughs> demographic, definitely. Um, yeah. We have almost every continent represented, so that's really awesome. Amazing. Uh, Awesome. All right. So guys, thank you so much for attending. And Dr. Sommer, thank you so much for your time. Um, sure. you, you definitely like gave us answers to questions and have opened up our eyes to the topic of menstrual health um, completely widely. I've learned so many new things and I'm sure a lot of other people have. Um, so it was awesome to have you. Um, if you guys want to learn um, more about the GATE program, I've linked the website in the, uh, the chat the Q&A box. Um, and it should be available to all of you guys in case you want to check it out. Um, they also have a Twitter. So you guys, if you have Twitter, make sure to follow them as well. Um, Dr. Sommer, is there anything you'd like us to promote? I know you mentioned the... Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll send you those links. One thing I forgot to tell you about, um, but I can, it's, not, it's probably linked to our Gate website. So last September, we launched the Period Posse Presents webinar series. And every month we did a webinar on something period related and they're all recorded. So September to June, they're all on somewhere on our website, Period Posse Presents. Um, and we're just developing our schedule to start up again in September. September, we're going to have Sesame Street talk about a puberty program they did in, in Zimbabwe. And a colleague of mine from Bolivia talk about a menstruation promotion campaign she did on the radio. So, um, so if you go to Period Posse Presents, if you want to learn more about periods, I would sign up for the mailing list. Um, and then you'll just automatically get the updates. Um, every time we're having a, a webinar, so. Awesome, That's and cool. once we, definitely, once we finish this, I'll send you guys, a, I'll talk to Dr. Sommer and send you guys the links to everything so you guys can check it out and also have access to that webinar series. You can't miss Sesame Street, so make sure you guys <laughs> definitely should come. I'll definitely try to come. Um, but other than that, that was everything. Um, thank you guys so much for your time. I hope this was really um, a lear good learning experience and you guys learned something new. Um, and other than that, I think that's pretty much it. If you guys want to sign up for more sessions, speaking of um, the topic of the broad range of medical inequities, next week's session is with um, Dr. Onikara Nukara, who um, was an ex-president of Doctors Without Borders and um, he also did work at Yale. So hopefully we can see you guys again next week. Um, if you guys want to and have the time, it's only one hour. So it's a great way to intellectually challenge yourself. But other than that, that's pretty much it guys. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and somebody also in the chat said this was a really interesting meeting. Thank you for your time. So Dr. Sommer, once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day or evening, whatever time zone you're in and stay yeah. safe everybody. Bye guys. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.